I want to address the concept of the ego and the shadow and also the word doubt. Because the, the, really, the ego is a shadow of doubt. That figure of speech we have, you know, just beyond a shadow of a doubt. Well, a shadow, the ego is nothing but a shadow of doubt. It was created when we had a shadow of doubt about who we are. So really, the ego is just our low self-worth. It's self-doubt. Having self-worth can, you know, it's not coming from motivational speakers. Self-doubt, I mean, self, the, the real self, you know, the self-worth, the real self can only really, and it's important to capital R on that, come from God. It created us to have a divine self. So when we're in touch with the one God created, then we're in touch with our true self, and we wouldn't have self-doubt because we have self-worth. We have value. That's why I've said so often, people need to just get deeper, man. But okay, anyway, you know, <laughs> like just think a bit deeper. When you do things for people, you think it's, oh, good karma. And technically, if you do things for good karma, there's still a selfishness to it. You know, you're still kind of like, mm-hmm. You watching? You know? Do good for goodness sake. <laughs> that just worked, this just worked into that, didn't it? <laughs> um, but, but, you know, to be good, it's the right thing to do. But there's a there's a, a message behind it when you do good things for people listen carefully you are teaching them that they have value and when you send the message that they have value of course they have free will they can i'm not deserving and you know no you know you go to give them a warm hug and they're like you know they throw you a shoulder you know and People have the right to block things, and they also have wounds, of course, that they don't want to accept gifts of money or hugs or whatever. That's fine. Honor where they're at. Always honor where people are at. Bring things just to their level. That's fine. But it's interesting to me because our real self is the God self. You could say there's a real self, the God self. Then there's a soul self, the one that thinks it's separated and began a journey through the universe of learning and so on and so on. Then there's this human ego-based self that's messed up, the limited self. And humans keep trying to improve the limited self and have a new improved limited self. <laughs> but it's still a limited self. And they go, yeah, but I'm, I'm just lesser messed up than I was. It's like I'm destruction light, you know, like, <laughs> you know, self-abuse light, you know. And that's all just fine. But at some point, now people that are not on the path, they're really only going to go so far. They're only going to go from total self-destruction to mild self-destruction if they're not on the path. When you get on the path, it means you've started to become aware of the soul. Doesn't mean you're perfect or holy yet, but because you've become aware of the soul, because there's three selves, when you let go of the ego self to the soul self, you'll eventually find the God self. But the soul self means... I'm not just working on myself. That's what people that don't even believe in spirit or God or love or whatever, they even try to improve once in a while. You could have a person that's totally messed up and on self-destruct mode, and they might just start working out a little bit more or whatever to, to get their body to not ache as much. That doesn't mean they're, they're like holy or something. They're, they're just getting a little further. If you want to get on the soul path, you've got to wake up to the soul. You have to acknowledge that you have a soul, that you have a value, something more than just the material, limited, human, mortal self. And I believe that when we gift people things, with the, especially the right intention, what we're doing is we're saying you have value. It's the most beautiful message you can give a person, that you have value. They can be totally messed up, but when you try your best to answer with a yes as often as you can. This is part of what Jesus meant when he says, when someone asks for your coat, give them your shirt as well. Now he says in A Course in Miracles, that was misinterpreted to mean that I'm saying be sacrificial, that you should be a rescuer. When they ask for your coat, give them your shirt and your shoes and the rest of your clothes so you can get arrested for, you know, <laughs> indecent exposure. Why do they assume it's indecent, by the way? Now, anyway, so... <laughs> So, you, you see, he's saying, I didn't mean for you to do things, give things that would harm others or yourself. Harm meaning what? 
You could enable people's behaviors by giving to them everything they ask for. So that would be one version of harming. Harming yourself, because you gave more than you could afford, energetically or emotionally and so on. So this idea of, of giving that helps people feel of value. So when Jesus was saying, give them not just your coat, but your shirt, he meant give them, give them even beyond the material thing like a coat. Go further, but he didn't mean materially necessarily. He's talking, give more. Show people that they have value. Well, but why? And I get that all the time. What? Who? Why? And my most often answer when I have people say, well, why are you giving that? You deserve it. It's great. It stumps them. And you know they're going to be thinking about it later. And I like that. <laughs> it's like saying, don't ever forget me. You know? You stump them. You, you make them sit there. What do they mean by I have value? And that's a good thing to get people kind of contemplating. Yes, you do have value. You know, and, and give to others too. Imagine this. What if I have gift, and I, I've told you guys, I get gift cards of whatever I, I have at the end of a year, I try to pull it aside and then put it in gift cards, you know, in 20 or 50 or whatever I've got into gift cards and go to a certain store or so and start handing them out to people. But imagine, what if I'm giving that out and I gave out, let's say, 10 $20 bills or 10 $50 bills or whatever it is, and imagine that those folks, what if I, I can get them to believe you know, always give, always share. What if I get them to give away five or ten of those dollars? You see what I'm saying? People start getting in this mode of it's okay. Now, of course, they're going to be thinking Christmas. So also randomly through the year, do the same thing. You know, just leave a little extra tip to a waitress. You did a great job today. I've done it when they've done a job where I just could hear their boss nagging them. Move that. You're not moving fast enough. Hey, you're doing great. You see what I'm saying? Like, now, if somebody's doing something hurtful, harmful, or whatever, I wouldn't say always give a gift because you could enable that they're not doing really a great job of something. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But by all means, where you can and how you can. And when you see people in need, um, we have our, our tree over there, and there's a few cards left on it. Take them if you would. I was at a church once, a, a, a unity. Uh, this was in uh, a big city in, in uh, uh, Canada. And, and I remember, you know, I was getting ready to talk, and they said, well, and here's our gift-giving tree. There's cards on it for all the local children that don't have gifts, and it's full, full of cards. And this is the last day, and, well, gosh, you know, nobody's really taken any cards. And I'm thinking, this is, like, insane. Like, come on, I understand some people don't have, but I know that, you know, people can afford these things. So, so I'm like, okay. You know, now when it's my turn to talk. Hey, everybody. Uh, good to see you. Oh, good to have Michael back. And Michael's going to do a great talk. Yeah, after I tell you <laughs> something about that tree. <laughs> Why in the heck are there so many cards left on it? What are we thinking? You know, come on, guys. I'll take three. Now, let's do it. And the thing was emptied. It was. At the end of the service, they said, oh, my God, it was amazing. It is. But they could have also stood up there with the same voice of confidence. Come on, guys. But they didn't. And so it's mirroring in their project that's gone nowhere. So us stepping up and voicing ourselves, it's not just for us that we're doing that, obviously. We're trying to send a message to people. So, you know, get, get that frequency to go through like, hello, people. And it makes a difference. But this is a moment, it's humor, it's, it's going that extra mile, that extra yard or whatever. However you can do it, do it. I've told the story before where I went to a unity, I think it was in uh, um, maybe Georgia, or I think it might have been uh, one of the Carolinas. And, you know, and I was going to talk, and I was, I think, my first time there. And there was the, um, the music in, um, person, the main music facilitator, and... You know, and she said, you know, um, Michael, my daughter's planning to do the daily word. Would you mind if she does the daily word? I don't, yeah, I'm just here to do a talk. I'm fine with it, you know. Okay, you know, because she's a little nervous. Okay, so now I'm getting ready, and the service is getting ready to start. They start, they do the first couple songs, time for the daily word. The little girl goes up, and she, you know, gets her little daily word, and she breaks it open, you know. And, but one word, one word. And tears, she down, collapses in her mom's lap, you know. It's another, 
It's another thing. It's a ha thing happening on earth. What are you going to do about it? Maybe nothing. You've got to listen for guidance. So I went up. So they said, okay, well, Michael, you better just go and, you know, cover the moment because it looks a little bad, you know, and the kid's crying. and her mom. So I went up and I said, okay, so we're going to begin the talk. And first we're going to do the daily word. Oh, wait, I don't have a copy of the daily word. What, do you, oh, do you have it? Can you bring it up here? Oh, thank you, honey. What's your name? Oh, thank you, honey. You know, whatever her name is, you know, um, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Oh, Karen, wait, which page is it going to be on? Okay, that one? You sure? Is that the one? What's it called? Okay. 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 Um, I, don't, I don't have my glasses, Karen. Can you just read the first sentence? You see? I don't even wear glasses. I'm like, I don't even. I lied. I don't care. <laughs> so, can you just read it? You know, and she reads it, and then, go ahead. Just, oh, you're doing great. Just continue. Boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. She finished it. It's a miracle. It happens, you know, it happens um, to any of us. My first talks, I could feel the butterflies. There's a saying, you could feel butterflies, just make them fly in formation. <laughs> you know, like, hey, you're going to be here. Mm. You know, let's do this right, baby. So it's okay, but watch, because there's stuff every day. There's opportunities to make a huge difference in a person's life. And I mean, the kid went and sat down. You could just imagine how totally different her life was. And the mom's looking at me like, like the bewilderment, like she's like, thank you. But she's like, I don't know how you did it. It's, we should all be thinking like that. We're all capable of it. You see, I just talked to my youngest daughter the other day, and we had a long chat. It's been a while, and you know, how's it going? And I'm saying, you know, we're talking about, we brought up some past scenarios. And um, she said, yeah, remember you, you were... Uh, uh, unexpectedly, suddenly, our softball coach, because I had three little girls at the time, and she said, remember, and I don't even know anything about baseball or anything like that, but I became their coach. I said, well, actually, it was the assistant coach, you know, but, you know, you had a coach, and he was running things, but he was tending to, you know, kind of be a little buzzed when he showed up, so I could tell he needed some help, so I kind of went, oh, okay, I'll help, and, and she goes, yeah, and, and, you know, and I said, and it was, wasn't it fun? She goes, yeah. She goes, we were undefeated for two years that you did this for us. I said, isn't that great? I said, but, but besides that, do you remember anything else? Yes. <laughs> you were so annoying, Dad. <laughs> you wouldn't let us keep score. You know, she's like, this is the league. You're not supposed to show up and make up rules. You wouldn't let us keep score. And she goes, and, and you, would, you would go out, and if the other team struck out, you would say it's unacceptable that every kid gets to be pitched again and again until they hit the ball. <laughs> There's no three strikes. <laughs> okay, watch. Watch the ball now. On three. One, two, now. And, they, you know, I, until they hit the ball. You know, and my kids are just like, oh. You know, they're be you could just see it. They're behind the metal thing, you know, whatever they call the back thing. And they're just like, their heads are dropped. They're, he's such an embarrassment, you know. And, and again, I don't care. It's the right thing to do. And they get that. They get that. And they got it then because they knew this is, this, he's impossible, this father of ours. But, but it was great. But it's the right thing. Keep bringing goodness. Christmas isn't December 24th, 5th. It's supposed to be every day because it's the birth of Christ. And birth of Christ means anytime you and I bring the presence. Not the presence, the presence. And we bring that presence when we give somebody another chance. I don't mean hurtful people enabled. I'm talking about the kids that struck out. And I mean, this one mom said to me, Michael, you have no idea. And I thought she was just, you know, thank you for the patience and pitching the ball. And, you know, and she said, no, you don't understand. My daughter has failed at anything she's ever tried. And she was, you know, one of those kids you can just tell. It, you know, voted last on the team or picked last. You know, one of those. And we've all been one or seen that before in our days. And she said, that's all that's ever happened to her. And that was the first time she's ever, and to her it was huge. She hit the ball, and she made it to first base. Especially since I had my foot on the ball while the kids were trying to get it and throw it to first base. <laughs> what? What? Oh! Oh, I'm so, God, I'm so embarrassed. Hold on, I'm going to move my foot. Ready? Okay, you can go. 
<laughs> you know, it's just, the games were lengthy, but they were fun. <laughs> if your goodness makes everybody miserable, at least have a good time with it, you know. You should never be doing it to be hurtful or hateful, but, but seriously, man, have a good time of it. And so bring, you know, bring the presence of Christ, which is you. That's our real self. Bring the presence of goodness. Santa, Santa Claus, is a real person. That was a historic character. And he was. He was a person who brought gifts to children. And I think it's great. The Catholic Church put him in prison for it, believe it or not. But they did. So he was in prison for it. But do right, because it's the right thing to do, even if other people don't dig it. They don't understand it. I've heard people say things like, oh, well, you're, 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 erasing people's lessons if you, you know, heal them from things. I don't care. Because in God, there's no such lesson. Jesus said, hey, I'm the light of the world. When I'm in the world, there's going to be light. You go hide under a rock if you want, if you want to stay in darkness. But I'm the light of the world. So you don't have to be apologetic for being good and to be light. Bring it. So give gifts, and some people don't dig it. I'm not telling you to be hurtful to people and no overly annoying. If it gets to that point, Brush off the dust and walk away. Brush off that experience and walk away and go do good. Somewhere else where it's more acceptable. But do what you can afford. And Santa Claus, uh, Saint Nicholas, was a real person and is sainted. And, um, you know, and I look back in, in life and how life is because Every one of us is technically Santa Claus would be a symbol of angels because angels are gifting or messengers of God. So technically Santa Claus then would be a symbol of like an angel, which would be why he would have all his magic powers in, in, the, in the mythologies of it, the stories that we make of it. I think it's beautiful. But I think it's also beautiful to understand that we have magic and that we can make things happen, that we can multiply loaves. You know, if I say, um, I, I gave away five $20 gift cards yesterday, and I tell you great stories about what happened, and I say, so if anybody else wants me to do that for them, you give me some donations, I would get them, which would mean it would multiply. You see what I'm saying? My story would make my gift card cards suddenly multiply. You see? It, it, stories, words, miracles, these, these things, they all bring... They all help multiply the miracles, so it's good stuff. Even when you tell a story about a miracle you've had, it helps spread that miracle. Even that thing not happening to them, it brings them a story of, hmm, maybe there's hope. So this is all really, really cool stuff. The more you give, then, the more you're playing that role. Not just of Santa Claus, but of, of an angel. And one of the greatest gifts you can give any person Believe it or not, it's strange because it has nothing to do with a material thing. One of the greatest gifts you can give any person is to, look, to show them how to say no to the ego. Show them how to say no to the ego and yes to the Christ self. Teach people, teach people that you have discipline. You're not you know, telling them what to do. Just show that you know how to say no to the ego. Ego like gossip, no thanks. Ego like judgment. No thanks. Ego in the form of hate. No thanks. You're giving them a gift by showing them no to the ego. But that's only half of the greatest gift in the world. The other half is to affirm their goodness, affirm their presence. When I'm pitching the ball to those kids, it's in part, it's affirming their goodness. I know you can do it. No, because I never get anything right and it always goes wrong. It doesn't matter. I'm going to stay here because I believe differently. You see what I'm saying there? That's the affirming, the affirmation. I believe in you. You're going to get it. And they hit the ball and, my God, everything can change in that one moment. And, and honestly, this wasn't, uh, there wasn't anybody having a problem with it. They understood. They, you know, they would cheer kids along. Other team, you know, families would cheer the other kids on because they caught on. Love is contagious in ways that people just don't understand. So this concept Let's say it's at Christmas time. We use the words, you know, have you been naughty or nice? So we think of Santa Claus as the one that gives gifts for being nice. But it's true. The universe will give you gifts for all the nice things you do. When you, when you give, more is going to come to you. But what about when you're naughty? 
the universe can also bring you something else. It's called lessons. So the universe brings you gifts or lessons. It's like there's no, there's no losers. You either get a gift or a wonderful parting gift. You know, you know right? Tell them what they won, St. Peter. You know, I always think that's funny. Well, a lifetime supply of karma. No, you know, but, you know, three more relationships, just like the last one. <laughs> so, the gifts that never stop giving. So good, nice brings gifts. Do you want gifts? Then continue to be nice. Well, I've been nice for three weeks and nothing's changed. We don't know how long you've been messed up. This could be, this could be, you know, could be lifetimes. The good news is, and this, this is true, none of us, I think, most or none of us uh, like to lose things. Like, you lost money on a, on a car, you bought a house, you bought on an investment. It's a drag. You had a, a $10 bill in your pocket and you had a hole in your pocket, it slipped out, you lost it. It doesn't actually work that way. You can't actually ever lose anything because there is nothing other than you. There's you and a mirror of you. That's all we've got here. So, and there's us and a mirror of us. So you lost 10 bucks, you lost 10,000 bucks. What's happened is, if it does not come back, it is invested by a spiritual investor who's paying off some old bills <laughs> for you that you forgot. Or if they go, well, we've, we, look, we just found $10,000 that you gave in a, 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 you know, some investment somewhere, you know, in, in the market and it got lost. It doesn't work. You don't lose, you can't lose anything because there's only you. But it's gone. It seems like it's gone. So the spiritual investment agency takes it and says, wow, 10,000. No, bummer for them, huh? No. Let's just take this. We're going to pay off this old debt, this one. We've got this one back here in the ancient Egyptian times, Assyrian lifetime. There was, you know, early colonial America, whatever. Paying off some old debts. They go, Look at this, we've got 2,500 left over. You know, they lost 10 grand. We got 2,500 left over. What they're going to do is either find some way for you to trip over a pile of $2,500 on the street, or they're going to invest it and it'll become something you'll receive tomorrow. Amen. Now, there's a problem. Thank you. Can I hear an amen? amen. Mm. Yes, Jesus, Jesus. So. When, when they give you the 2,500 and it's, it's like it's coming, here it comes, and you find a way to deny it, you do not accept the 2,500, mentally you don't believe, they go, well, we're, we're trying to put this in your account, but you've put up a firewall. No gifts from the universe. You don't know that you put that up. Lack of belief of deservability. No free gifts. I'm suspicious. Then it says, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll invest it. When you're open, it'll come to you. Then all of a sudden, some great thing comes to you financially, and you think, oh, it's, uh, you know, this amazing thing came out of the blue. N there's nothing lost out of the blue, nothing gained out of the blue. Everything is only you. And mirroring how we're doing. So be open to gifts. Be open to receive. You're, you deserve. But also teach other people that they deserve, because they do. God's already decided that. That's already been determined. In some traditions... The Norse countries, I think maybe um, into um, parts of Germany, Austria, and so forth, they don't just have a Santa Claus that brings you gifts for being nice. They have another being known as Krampus mm -hmm. or Krampen. Mm -hmm. And he brings, you know, they, they can make up all kinds of stories. They're really hazardous, torturous things to naughty people. But really... This individual is really only bringing lessons. He's actually only going to bring things that trigger people. It looks like they're not so nice things. Because, I mean, his name. Who wants to be called Krampen? Or Krampus? You know? And this is where we get cramping. Grumpy. Grandpa. No. Um, <laughs> it's true. These words are all related. The, the grumpy... And Krampus, I know, it sounds strange, but these words are related. Because Krampus is not a bad guy. He's there to say, 
You need to learn some things. And if you learn them, you'll get good. So he's still a good guy at the end of the day, too. You know, and Krampus is said to be um, related to other characters in mythologies, you know, uh, like um, Loki. And Loki's got a daughter named Hel. Yeah. You know, and so she's the goddess of, she ends up the goddess of hell. But Loki is, is like, you know, not the movie Loki, it's somewhat the same, but not quite. Um, I, I like that guy. Yeah, I saw the, 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 some footage of that movie they made on Thor, but I like the Loki dude. He's just cool looking. But anyway, um, you know. But, so they make him kind of have a half mischievous energy, but mostly almost a good guy energy. No, Loki is the reflection of our self-doubts. Again, the ego is a shadow of a doubt. Loki is a manifestation of that shadow of a doubt. So in a sense, you could say they're made, made with an, an evil intention, but they're not. Because that evil intention is there to test you. Loki's only mischievous, and he can only be mischievous when you have things to look at. He goes after your little spots that are bullet, you know, buttons to push. And it's, he, Loki comes from the same as the East Indian Lo Kali. They only push buttons that are there. What's the defense? Don't have issues. <laughs> and you can say, I, I hope, I hope Loki doesn't visit. I hope Krampus doesn't come. And they made, you know, Krampus, they made a horror movie, a holiday movie out of, you know, Krampus. But, but it's interesting because in the movie based on, the, it's called the Antichrist Clause, you know? Um, no, I'm joking. That was, that was my name. It's, you know, instead of Santa Claus, it's the anti Santa Claus, Antichrist Clause. So it's a horror movie about a bad guy destroying this whole family, but the family members had become materialistic and lost faith in Christmas. So this thing was there putting them through hell, it, a horrorish movie, putting them through hell, but at the end of the movie, they got their lessons, and you can tell Krampus is like, you know, okay, you don't need me now. And you realize, wow, you know, if this is true, I wonder if it's true that everybody that symbolizes my cramping, the grumpy people in the world, I wonder if they're not all symbols of discomfort. And maybe my hidden discomforts, my hidden issues, that's all they're doing. There is no real evil, so, per se. It's really... The, the, the evils, they're just lessons. The reason we call them evils is because we don't like lessons. If we liked them, we would have done them. You know, we want to just pretend oh, it's not my issue. And it keeps coming back, so I just, I hate that evil. That was bad karma. That's somebody else's issue. We love that. I mean, we, you know, there was somebody posted on my friends of Michael Merdad, I forget the exact words, but, you know, uh, and, and, my, and mankind created evil or Satan. Yeah the devil, you know, because they didn't want to take responsibility. I'm just paraphrasing, but that's about right. You create Loki. You have to have somebody to blame. But if you look at the mythologies, they treat it differently. It's not going to even end up someone to blame because at the end, they're actually doing you a favor. But if that's true, then all the people that have been annoying and hurtful, they too have been playing a role. Our lessons. We're not saying their behaviors are nice, but we're saying somehow they're mirroring something to me. And if I get it, I can retire the pattern or the lesson. And that takes the, ta-da, you know, the big word, responsibility. Not everybody digs that. So there's, you know, a lot of confusion around these kinds of mythologies and, and, and Loki and his role, you know, but our, our job is just to, you know, um, Look at our weaknesses. That's all we have to do is look at them. Work on them. If you don't have weaknesses, these characters can't, including your exes and whatever else is in our lives, they can't appear in our lives to play the role. Because you get it. It's kind of like, nice, man. The issues aren't there. The buttons aren't there. And even when you've worked on yourself, these things will still come up and try. There's just nothing to push. But they'll try. And if you react and say, these things shouldn't be happening because I worked on myself, you have a new button. <laughs> Judging yourself for thinking you were done working on yourself. You know, and so it is. <sighs> you know, here comes hell. 
you know, here comes Loki or Kali or whatever else to, you know, come and purge away the stuff that you'd rather be done with. So, not really an evil, there's just my lessons. And the lessons will thin out, and they will thin out, and they will thin out until you have nothing but gifts. But you never just get random gifts as much as you think, and you never have random lessons. The lessons are all pertinent to our growth and lessons. And I don't mean, again, I'm going to make this clear, there isn't God in the sky saying, I find you to not be this enough or that enough, so I'm going to send you lessons. This isn't God. Our soul says, man, I could really use some work on patience. I know just who to bring into your life. The human self is like, you know, just clueless. And then the person shows up and they're like, oh, this is a big one, Elizabeth. You know, like Fred Sanford. Can't believe this is happening. How could this be? And, and all you have to do, quiet, turn, look inside and talk to your soul and say, are you the one that ordered? Mm-hmm. Why would you do that? Well, you, you've been needing some patience. Who says? Well, I have files here. <laughs> evidence. I have evidence that, you know, do you want to question me? Because I got evidence. This is just us. It's such a brilliant strategy. Sadly, when people talk about, you know, learning to take responsibility, man, that is the tip of the iceberg. When you think taking responsibility means, you know, did you drop that piece of trash there? Responsibility means everything is reflecting me. It's reflecting me and it's reflecting us. There's a good talk going on today. There's a bad talk going on today. I like the speaker. I didn't like the speaker, the talk or whatever, the songs, whatever. I don't like the song on the radio. I do like everything is reflecting us. When we get that, you find what other people spend lifetimes to, to achieve. This thing called peace that surpasses understanding. Things don't push your buttons as much. And it's not because you have learned to stuff all your emotions and know how to just look at life with, you know, no response or reactions. That's not what does it. It looks like that's what does it because people look like they have to discipline themselves to become enlightened. No. As soon as you realize it all is me, there's not a whole lot to react to anymore. It's not as much fun to be annoyed by people when you realize you're the only one. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really, you start to go, man, you, wait, you're me, I'm done. You know, but it is, it is going to cause agitation because there's a part of us, the ego self, that wants to take our self-doubts and not just suppress them and hide them. It prefers that we do that. But it, when that doesn't work, it wants to vent it. It's called project out onto other people. Make other people responsible. But in fact, the other people are just reflecting to us. And, and you know, and, and I know like, um, I think it was last week as I'm coming to a close in a moment. These are all just lessons. But the lessons are really multi-dimensional. They're not linear like intellectual realizations. They can be multi-dimensional, really trippy. Just like the, 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 the Krampus concept, that, that there's not just a Santa, there's also a, a, a symbolic being, not a devil, a symbolic being that brings you lessons to learn. In Western world, we made it a being that actually has power over you called a devil. In mythologies, it's always been just a character that's going to bring up your stuff. Almost like in all these stories of initiation and, you know, the hero's journey and the heroine's journey. And they go through all this. There's not anybody at the end of any of those stories that actually wins in your dust. It's typically tests. It's always just tests. You win, you don't win. And if you don't win, you can try other tests. But those stories are all about saying to you, you don't have to lose the test. You have everything you need to win the test. There's never been a mythology written, an ancient allegory given by ancient peoples that said, once upon a, the time, there was a person, they went through life's test, it was hopeless, the end. <laughs> it's just never written that way. They can have all kinds of layers of challenge, but there's potentially, always potential and hope that somebody's going to wake up and learn something. You know, so last week, I heard a couple people, you know, almost are misunderstanding when I was talking about gossip. And I said, step up and say no to gossip. 
It seems like a couple people thought I was talking about myself or Yogananda because I used a couple of examples. Like I'm saying, stick up for us, defend us teachers out there. Guys, not really because the truth doesn't need defended. Understand when I have said, step up against gossip, I'm saying step up against the ego. And I'm telling you to step up for your sake. The people you say no to are living in hell. Back to where I was talking about, because the people that are in hell are people that aren't getting it. So when you're not living in love, you're living in hell based on the mythology story version of it. And so people that come to you and want to gossip, they're already spiritually dead. Because hell is the place in the mythologies, hell is the land of the dead. So when people are gossiping, they're in hell and they are spiritually dead. So when you step up, you're giving them a shot saying, knock it off. Come on, you can come out of that place. Like me saying, swing again, you can do it. It doesn't mean gossip again. Gossiping means you're missing the ball, you're missing the point. You just don't get it, do you? Focus, watch, time it, hit the ball. You can do something different today. Change your life, stop gossiping. But it's also good for you. Because when they're gossiping, again, you can't defend truth. You don't need to go and defend somebody that, against somebody that says, oh, I don't believe in Course in Miracles. Oh, my God. You know, you don't have to get all upset. They don't get it. Why would they if, if they're upset and they're gossiping about a book or a person or a teacher or whatever? They're spiritually dead. What are you going to expect from such a person? However, you're being tested. You, the one in the test, the one in the initiation, you're being tested. I think I shared the story, but a quick one would be this, this gal is running some major events and wanted me to be a speaker in the events. But a friend of hers who happens to live in Sedona said, oh, I heard something I didn't like about Michael. So it was like, wonderful. Here we go, a gossip kind of thing. And people in this town tend to do that, but in the world they tend to do it. So what's interesting is the person that's running this event heard this and it made them doubt whether they wanted me to be a speaker. So they made it clear, I'm going to think about that. You know what we told them? No need to think. We don't want to be in it. The fact that you would even doubt, the fact that you would even think, have to think about whether you want me in your talks or whatever you're having, conference or whatever, I'm not interested. You see what I'm saying? Someone has to say no. You should have said no to that person that was telling you gossip because it's all garbage anyway. You should have said no to them. And if not, great, I'll say no to you. Someone's got to send the message through. Do it where and when you can. Never be mean or self-righteous. Find a loving, tactful way to bridge. You can kind of, you know, be tactful and whatever about it, but clear. Clear. You know, things like, yeah, I, I, I don't believe in that sort of thing. It makes them go, really? Because they do. But, but I, what if it's true? Yeah, but I, I know Yogananda. I know his life really well, and people have said things about him, and it's not true. But, you know, whenever I hear somebody say things about him, it makes me wonder about them. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I shouldn't be your friend. Yeah, maybe. Because if you want to be my friend, I would like to talk about truth, not lies. I would plant seeds like that, man. I mean, sometimes I'll be more gentle and tactful than that, but I'm not opposed to just going, bam, if that's what the moment's calling for. Life is filled with tests, and if you don't step up and pass the test, Krampus will come. I believe that unhealed wounds intensify our cramping, whether it's life, monthly cramping, mental cramping, shoulders cramping, you know, this... God is not constriction. It's expansion. And it doesn't make you bad or wrong because, oh, I have severe cramping every month or whatever it happens to be. It doesn't make you bad at all. You're a human being. And stuff gets stuck. Our issues, our fears, our, our memories, wounds, they accumulate and they get stuck. The solution? Find ways to allow expansion. Talk. Talk to a therapist. Go try a different kind of a body worker. Do something to pass the test. I don't know that body work really ever can help something like this. Just have you tried? No, then try. Swing again, man. Come on, swing again. You can do it. Change whatever in your life. But it's not just for you. It's the people you're engaging with. It's interesting because human beings just have so many fears that they will not face. 
Fears become your own self-imposed hell. And the characters in there aren't a devil with a pitchfork. It's your fears looking embodied. That's all it is. The, the, the whole scene of hell, the whole scene of heaven, they're reflections of my mind. That's all. They're just reflections of my mind. You can't defend truth, but you do need to stand up for it. It doesn't need to be defended. It, it is what it is. It's light. Let it be. But you do need to stand for it. Why? Because it needs you. No, guys. Because when you stand for truth and say no to lies or any hurtfulness, when you say no, something's happened. It's called commitment. And when I committed to the truth or the reality and love of God, I became it. Do you see? I'm being tested. Testing doesn't mean you win. You have to actually win to win. The test itself is just a test. If you don't show up for the results, you know, it's not going to help you much. You, you show up. You're being tested and you say no to harm. And, and we'll, we'll do a talk a, a related to that, boundaries and yeses and nos in life. But um, I know that it's, it's an interesting thing, but people are so afraid. Reputation, feelings, whatever it happens to be, they guard themselves. And so they don't want to step. I don't want to lose a friend. Well, then you're not mine. Simple as that. Jesus says something very controversial in the scriptures. You're either with me or you're against me. <gasps> like, dude, whoa, Jesus, that's a bit much. Come on, dude. Lighten up. Nope, you're either with me or against me. Do you think he's throwing a tantrum? Well, forget it then, man. If you're not with me, you know, you're just against me. He's saying you, you are either standing with the truth and what I represent or you don't. He's talking to you. And that's what we're doing in such cases. Now, when you do it, you do have to watch your, you know, if you just take what Michael said and go to somebody and that's not allowed and I don't agree with that and you're coming from this insecure, unintegrated place, it's not going to come across very well. You have to actually believe it. And if you don't believe it, then wait till the day you do. But you all, we all have to come to the place where we believe truth and not just talk it. And we can demonstrate the difference. We shifted from talking it to truly believing it when you've integrated it. How do you integrate it? Living it. How do you live it? No to ego, yes to God. Prove it. Step up. You're being tested. Step up. Even when a friend in high school was threatened, his life was threatened for some reason, and some people from another school called him and said, we're, gonna, we're coming to kill you. You know, and all, all of our friends who were sitting around talking about it, I walked up and they said, hey, you know, did you hear such and such? And, um, you know, they said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, when he walks from this place to that place where they said they're going to kill him, I'm going to walk with him. Because if I die in that, I died righteously. I'm not telling you to do the same things I would do because I'm a little nuts. <laughs> uh, you know, I am a little weird. I definitely have often gone places I don't think most people would or should go. It's because it's right for me and so on. But I did. I can't, I can't imagine that he should walk alone and be left in that. It's, it's gross to me. It's something doesn't, it doesn't work for me. He's going to go for, they're going to kill him when he does this or that. I can't, I just doesn't, it doesn't compute. And I told the story once when a kid was running, I was in a city at night once, and this kid was running down the street screaming for his life. And there was a gang after him trying to kill him. I just said, come here, stand behind me. <laughs> I had no idea what I, what am I going to do? You know, another person to shoot. But, but I, if you're going to die, you're not going to die alone. If you're afraid, I'm going to be with you while you're afraid. I was in a hospital once with a friend who was, his wife's having a baby. And I overheard some girl talking to the nurses as she's going into delivery room. And they said, so you don't have any family, honey? No. You know, I offer. It can seem inappropriate for a stranger to go. I understand that. So I was very tactful and careful about it. But I'm going to offer. She doesn't need to go into delivery alone. Why do we need that? With as many people as we have in the world, and they can't, one can't show like they care. So it's, you know, we have to learn to recognize we can afford it. How many gifts can Santa fit in his bag? Think about it logically, guys. <laughs> the, the bag would have to be the size of the planet to fill, fill all, you know, all the gifts of everybody. It, it, it isn't that big of a bag. It's the magic that 
You empty one, there's always more. There's always more. So give of yourself, there's always more. But people don't understand the magic yet. There's always more. Believe. Please take a few centering breaths. Setting aside all the stuff of the world, all the typical thoughts, worries, concerns. Let's do today a little bit of a visualization along these lines. Picture everyone in the room and the room itself disappears. Just fades away. Like a mystical vision. The room is cleared. And you're standing in a room empty, a slight cloud around, and you're aware of your soul, a being of light. And you look to your side and you see a costume. A costume of the creepy Krampus evil character. And we're going to put the costume on. When they have these celebrations and people dress up, they're supposed to look as wicked as possible. Go ahead. It's all right. It's just play. Put on the costume. And you can look in a mirror to the other side and see suddenly what you are dressed up as. What do you look like? If this person symbolizes all the messages of things you need to learn, lessons you need to learn, your biggest lessons, your most recurring issues, let this character dress accordingly. Creepy. It could be violent or loud or large colored a certain way, disheveled. Make it as vivid as possible because you're dressing up. This is the character that symbolizes lessons. And you look in the mirror and you're saying, wow, intense. You might not even like looking at it. It might be amusing. Whatever it brings up, just see it. It's the symbol of what you need to learn. Now you look in the mirror at that creature, that character that you're dressed up as. Ask the image in the mirror what primary lesson or lessons or patterns do you represent for me in this lifetime? And watch it in the mirror and let it answer. Try to stay objective. Make sure you got it. And then we'll watch in that mirror the character, big bad wolf kind of guy. He's going to lift off his hood and underneath it's going to reveal a person you've known in this lifetime that's been a challenge for you and see who it is. An ex, a parent, 
friend, a child, an employee, whatever they are, let, let it happen, whoever it is. So not only do we have the big mythological character, the exaggeration, but on a day-to-day -day basis, who has played this out for you? Oh, them. Might be a surprise who you see and might not. Remember the lesson that the creature told you they were there to teach you? Now, isn't it possible this person also played out and was there teaching you that particular lesson? See it that way instead of good, bad guy, bad guy. Just see it. Did they play out the role well or not? Did they play out betrayer, deceiver? It's okay. We're not going to hate for it. Just let it be what it is. That's what they played out. Now that we understand they've played a role, can we retire them from that role? And if you have any trouble at all retiring them from the role, it's not a problem. But just do this. Watch in the mirror and watch them pull the hood off of them. And what was under that? Remember we started your soul. Pull off their hood and see yourself again as a being of light. Let the costume fall to the ground. We're behind it all, whether we like it or not. If we took more responsibility and owned such things, people wouldn't have to dress up accordingly. What conversation, briefly, can you have right now, looking in the mirror, with yourself? What conversation can you have with yourself now from what you just learned about the creature and about the people that have manifested in your life? How much do you want to hate yourself or them for any of the experiences? Have an intelligent, healthy conversation for half a minute. Your form of resigning this and retiring this whether it's apologies, amends. It doesn't so much matter why we allowed ourselves to get caught up in this masks and other people and blame. It doesn't matter as much as seeing that we've done it and own it, take responsibility for it. The truth is, it's fear and doubt. A shadow of a doubt allows us to manifest things in the forms that they do. They become characters bad guys, and so on. Starting with a shadow of a doubt. A doubt of what? Who we are. The cure? Knowing who we are, like Buddha said. Knowing who we are is the cure. So let's have a few breaths breathing in our value. We really are good people. And if you think still that you're not, make some adjustments and become one. You can't, you can't lose. Be. Be nicer, more loving, more giving. Make a difference and help people feel valued. And so it is. And so it is.